audio for that, which is gonna be great. Three, two, one, action. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Squid Think. Hi, this is Anais Dawson. Uh, she's from Draw Curiosity on YouTube. And Hello. she has been so generous as to make the time to talk about insects. And specifically, the deadliest ones, because yeah. you know, insects are badass. Protect yourself. So insects are a class and they are in the phylum Arthropoda. Arthropoda comes from the Greek words of arthron, meaning joint, and poda, meaning leg or foot. So they are joint, leg slash footed. Up to you, up to your discretion as to which one. There are many subclasses within Insecta, such as Paleoptera, which includes orders like Odonata, which has dragonflies and mayflies, or Paraneoptera, which includes things like Hemiptera, which are the true bugs. So don't just go around calling insects bugs because you're wrong, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two reasons why the insects that we're going to be talking about today are deadly. We're going to be talking about two types, vectors and venomous. So if you're a vector, you are a disease carrying organism and that is bad. We don't like, we don't like vectors. And there are a lot of insects that do that. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. And we're going to be talking about the venomous ones. Remember the difference between venomous and poisonous. Poisonous is you munch on them, you die. Venomous is they munch on you, you die. Did I say that right? You did. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I was like, good, she knows it. The vast majority of insects that we're going to be looking at all belong to Endoterygota because pretty much the vast majority of insects can be found there. And the reason why is because the larval form is different to the adult form, so they undergo metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Yeah. <laughs> Think your caterpillar that becomes a butterfly or your maggot that becomes a fly or a beetle. There are many, many, many good things about having your youthful form to be very different to your adult form, which is your youngsters and your adults don't actually compete for the same niche. But it also means they can get quite crazy life cycles where they heavily specialise yeah. on particular particular animals which will play into their vector lifestyle. <laughs> How interesting, don't you want to learn more? One of the orders that we're going to be talking about today is Siphonoptera, so that includes the fleas. They have 2,500 species within them. They're obligate ectoparasites, which means they have to live on top of a body in order to live. They have to be drinking your blood because they suck. Get it? <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> They have a lifespan of roughly 100 days and they are ridiculously fast breeders. They lay about 50 eggs a day and they can lay up to 2,000 within their life cycle. So why are these guys deadly? Fleas. We all know about fleas because we all know about the Black Plague. We all know about the Black Death where about 25 million people died. The plague is quite rare nowadays, but it is still around. Symptoms of the plague can include things like diarrhea, um, extreme vomiting, gangrene where your skin just turns black and necrosis and falls off your body, which you don't want in case you didn't know. <laughs> I mean, you might want a necrotic black arm if, you know, that's your thing. Not, not sure if it's in style or not, but free costume. <laughs> yeah, free costume. Yeah, get the, just get the plague. <laughs> They're also vectors of Lyme disease. This can cause skin rashes, headaches, night sweats, or heart and neurological problems. Lyme disease can cause a cardiological symptom called heart block. There were three reported deaths because of this from 2012 to 2013. So, is, is deadly, is not good. I also did not realise that fleas could be carriers of Lyme disease because I always thought of them as, you know, the ticks. Mm. The famous ticks from the fields are the ones that carry it and... I mean, plenty of ticks do carry Lyme disease. Yeah. It's unsurprising that there should be sucky bugs that would do that as well. They can also cause marine typhus, which causes joint and back pain and more nausea and more vomiting and many more diseases as well. <laughs> so many, in fact, we don't have time to talk about them. So let's move on to the next insect. Fronting the next section are the Hymenopterans, which are the bees, the wasps, and the ants. And we're going to talk about the fire ants. So fire ant bites, apart from hurting a bit like fire, can cause death in up to around 5% of cases. This is because there's a toxin, which is an alkaloid protein called solenopsin, which can cause an allergic reaction um, in around 5% of people, or basically cause an anaphylactic shock. So whilst one or two bites is probably fine, if you do find yourself caught up in a fire ant nest and you happen to be allergic, that could spell bad news for you if you're not able to get an EpiPen or a hospital pretty mm. soon. Or if you're like me and you can't use an EpiPen in your anaphylactic reaction, you're fucked. <laughs> Another notable mention from Hymenoptera is the Africanized honeybees. They're genetically modified to survive better in tropical conditions and to provide more honey. 
Africanized honeybees are far more aggressive than traditional well, than traditional bees? <laughs> European. Approximately a thousand deaths per year are attributed to Africanized honeybees, and that's because they sting ten times more than European honeybees. They also have more aggressive behavior in general, and they're higher on guards. So honeybees have guards outside of their nests so the other bees, or intruders like wasps or other um, insects, don't steal their hard-earned honey. <laughs> There's many theories as to how they uh, differentiate between conspecifics and allospecifics. One of these theories is the odor convergence hypothesis, where different species or different hives will forage on different plants. So one might forage on an orange blossom and take nectar from the orange blossom tree, and others might take it from a jasmine bush or something like that. However, many experiments have been done which have kind of disproven this one. So the primary theory at the moment is pheromones. And in fact, it's most likely, almost certainly, pheromones because Hymenopterans have these CHCs, or special compounds found on their cuticles, um, which is determined genetically, and basically, the more related all of the individuals are inside the hive, um, the more likely they are to have kind of a unified hive smell, where everyone smells <laughs> the same. And my guess, because I don't actually know this, but I think that Africanized honeybees probably only have one drone and maybe the queen is monogamous, which means that all of them are highly related, so there's mm. higher stakes for all of the workers to try and protect the hive a lot more. Which, if I can be sneaky and do a self-promo, I do have a video on superorganisms, which is Check all about <laughs> how very strict monogamy in organisms causes the evolution of superorganisms, and quite possibly that might be what's happening with these Africanized honeybees, but also apparently with Strict monogamy comes strict aggressiveness against everyone who's not from the clan. Rad. <laughs> we have a prop for the next one. <laughs> so the next one is the Asian... I, was, I, I almost said Asian giant African hornet. I was like, yeah, the, no. no, Asian, no, no. Iron, Asian giant <laughs> European African hornet. <laughs> to spread all over the world and change its name. It's a symbol of diversity. <laughs> next up is probably the one you've been waiting for, which is the Asian giant hornet. Um, they cause around 30 to 50 deaths annually in Japan. They're pretty hefty in size, um, so this is not a deadly hornet. Um, it's in fact, a, it's the largest European wasp species. Um, and it's actually pretty docile, it just likes to sting scarabs and not much else. Um, but it's pretty big. The Asian hornet is bigger than this. Not only do they sting you, but when you kill one of them, they actually release uh, an attack pheromone, which calls out to all of the other ones who go into, essentially, guarding mode, and they'll all go and sting you together. And it's a similar situation as with maybe the fire ants or with honeybees, where one or two stings might be fine, but when you're pretty much attacked by a swarm, it's a lot more likely to cause or trigger an anaphylactic reaction. And being so large and having such a dangerous sting already makes them a lot more dangerous. So if you ever see a hornet, be careful, like Asian hornet or any kind of hornet. Just stay away from them. Appreciate their largeness from afar. They're big for a reason. You can see them just as well whilst maintaining a good distance. In addition to squishing other hornets as a way to trigger their pheromones, there are also C5 to C10 esters which can do this, such as certain food scents. I think apple flavors mm. were one of the ones I'd read about. Just watch out when eating apples around in Japan. Fortunately, apples are quite expensive in Japan, so oh, maybe... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next order we're gonna be talking about is Hemiptera, otherwise known as the true bugs, the ones that I mentioned in the beginning that I got mad at you for calling other insects bugs for. The bug that we're gonna be talking about from the Hemiptera order is the kissing bugs. These are found in Asia, Africa, Australia, and in some parts of America. They're part of the subfamily Tritomine, and they're also potential vectors for Chagas disease. I had a bit of a scare with Chagas disease, and by a bit of a scare I mean I got bitten by a kissing bug. At the time I wasn't too sure if I could be at risk of Chagas or not. Basically kissing bugs poop as they eat, and then the parasite is found in the poop and it's quite easy for it to get into the wounds on your face. Nature is beautiful. <laughs> Only about 20% of people get the acute phase of Chagas disease, so it's usually characterized by what's known as Romagna's symptom, where your face swells up or the site of the bite and you might get a fever and you might get some form of malaise. However, this usually happens in people who are younger or elderly patients or maybe immunocompromised people. But it's not unusual to develop it, but just not know about it. And then it goes on to the chronic phase, so the parasite will lodge itself somewhere in your body, usually heart muscle, 
um, and then it just goes dormant for a very long time until it decides to resurface. What happens then? <laughs> so it can do one of two things. It can either affect your nervous system, so it can affect your motor skills, which can cause dementia and confusion, or it can affect your digestive system, and cause enlargement of the tissues, giving you a mega colon or a mega esophagus. That being said, there is some good news, and it is that Chagas isn't quite the death sentence it used to be. Firstly, detection methods are a lot better, so in my case I actually got an antibody test done, and it came back clear, so pretty much it was just me being worried about bites appearing on my face. But if it does come out positive, there are special medicines that are targeted to these parasites. Um, so you would have to take them, I think, for a few months or for however long your doctor says. The medication does come with side effects, so it won't be pleasant, but in most cases it completely gets rid of it. And of course, the best thing to do is always to exercise caution. If you're going somewhere that could be da dangerous um, or contain dangerous insects, then obviously wear DEET, have mosquito repellent, um, have a mosquito net, check your mattress for bed bugs, bugs, fleas, anything that could potentially prey on you at night and enjoy your stay. <laughs> you a travel lodge. <laughs> We're filming in a hotel right now, if you can't tell. Um, yeah. We both walked into the lobby and we saw this giant crystal chandelier and we both just kind of went, holy f <laughs> She found a jaguar in the toilet. I still don't know if this is the car jaguar or like a oh. animal jaguar, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It, it has the same level of opulence. I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I'm just gonna leave that to your imagination. And I'll say one more thing. There were two of them. Screams luxury, doesn't scream bedbugs. <laughs> so what have we learnt from today? Number one, we've learnt that lots of tiny things can kill you. We really should mention though that all of the insects that we've talked about today and all of the diseases that you can get, the deaths that are associated with the insects that we've been talking about are really rare. In fact, you're much more likely to have a far more common death through, I don't know, being run over or being in a traffic accident or maybe having a tree fall on top of you. I'm terrified of trees. In practice, you know, watch out for certain, bu for certain bugs of the true and fake variety. Mm -hmm. But as you say, we tend to glamorize fear and things that are unusual but scary and out, you know, out of this world. We're much more likely to talk about them and remember them, but they're a lot less likely to happen as well. What we're trying to say is that nature, yes, it can be dangerous and yes, it can be scary, but it's also really, really important. And insects, as tiny as they are, are also vitally important to the ecosystem. And honestly, <laughs> most of the time, they're probably a little bit more scared of you rather than vice versa. I mean, there is a reason that these bees are attacking intruders in the first place. They're just trying to protect their home. Yeah. As long as you stay away from them, give them their breathing space, there's no reason they should come for you. Remember that we share the planet with a bunch of things and some of those things have six legs. And you and should be nice to them. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them bite, and some of them sting, some of them are vectors, some of them are venomous, but all of them are lovely. I also feel we should have mentioned mosquitoes. Yeah, we really should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully you've learnt something new from today's video. Yeah. And about a few new insects. And hopefully you were someone who didn't hate insects, or I hope you don't hate them now after hearing about them. The vast majority are good eggs. Mm -hmm. Just doing their ecological niche job out there. A lot of them are pollinators as well, so you know, next time you bite into a juicy apple, not around wasps though, remember we talked <laughs> about this. You have the bees and the other pollinators and all the lovely things with wings to thank for that. But yeah, that's all we have for you today, guys. I really, really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then hit the like button because it's a free way that you can support the channel. Please go and check out um, Inace's channel because oh my goodness. She's so good, and she's so professional, so knowledgeable. She's got a PhD, she's so smart. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> I will leave all of her information in the description box below, as well as on screen somewhere. I don't know where it's going to be, but it'll be on screen. And yeah, thank you so much for watching us. Yeah. And we'll see you in one of the next ones. Rad. See you guys later. Bye. <laughs> I'm going to go turn it off, because that's what I normally do when I end my videos. <laughs> okay.